and then um we're being we're being encouraged to take that onto our placements um in various different ways and um yeah the picture's evolving as i'm staying on the course and um it's nice to hear leslie talk about the conference she went to recently being a bit more positive um because i've even noticed on the course things have started to be a little bit more positive but it's kind of baby steps so i'm interested oh. in hearing a bit more about your experiences as well that's exciting david that you're seeing some positive movement in your yeah training. Yeah, we had a whole day on intersectionality today, which I must admit, I woke up this morning absolutely dreading. Actually, I woke up this morning almost kind of like talking out loud these points to myself that I'm going to try and sort of say without stepping on landmines or get accused of this or whatever. And then it was it was a lot more like intersectionality as being this thing that's quite, quite uh, like mutable, quite changeable, that that actually people can transcend different categories and it might not be the same for you as it is to other people and privilege to one person might be something they want to feel guilty about but not for someone else and I thought gosh is this like a real self-reflective um realignment something a bit more liberal that's going on here I don't know I was getting a bit kind of like is this really happening but like some friends of mine on the course were just like thinking the same thing this feels a lot more adult like you said earlier Leslie it felt a lot more nuanced and it felt more of the kind of both and it can be this but it can also be this so I was quite encouraged but yeah baby steps does that feel like a bit of walking it back like a path back or does it feel more like making it more palatable so that it's more ingestible oh I'm sorry to be the black pill. <laughs> the poison tastes a little bit better yeah you're right <laughs> yeah that's right, what well, I've, I've actually wondered about that because i think that there are some people who are you know when i've heard people say oh at my children's school they're not so extreme on this they present it but they present it in a way that's you know that that makes more sense and i think well is that maybe doing more harm than good in a way because we're actually turning this ideology into something that that is more easily ingested. Like you said, the poison, I love that metaphor of poison tastes better. <laughs> I mean, the kind of, what I would say, the, the, the day that we had was a day in which we got to know each other a bit more as a cohort. And people were asked to sort of go to different parts of the room to talk about various parts of their identity. So there was like race, there was, um, there was social class, there was this, there was that. But then even once we were there, there were conversations where people sort of said, I don't know if I know what class means. I think it might mean might, it might mean finances, but it might be something about my accent. It might be something about this. It might be something about that. And then someone else would say, I used to feel like I was in this part of the class. And then I feel in it. So there was, it's kind of a, it's a hard thing, Leslie, because I feel like sometimes this stuff is the really good stuff that happens. And I end up kind of thinking to myself. Guys, that's not we don't we don't give credit to in, into fucking sectionality. <laughs> give the credit to yourselves for being people who are curious about different cultures and all this other stuff. But it does feel like intersectionality gets the credit. It's like this, these are the spaces where we talk about difference and social culture and stuff like that. And I feel a bit annoyed that that's the case. So I'm not quite sure how to rectify those things, but um I know what you mean. Oh, you're muted, Leslie. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, so I guess I should introduce what we're uh, what we're doing today. So welcome to Monday's live stream, Solid Ground, number 40, if I'm counting right. And we missed last week, so it, I hope everybody had a good week off and feels recharged. We're joined today by Andrew Didway, who uh, spoke with me a couple of weeks ago in a recording on this channel. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that, please go watch that. It's He's got a great story, great or disturbing, but really important story. And um, Andrew is a peer support specialist in community mental health in Portland, Oregon. And I think that one of the things that his story really represented for me was it's the application of the things that I was so concerned about when I was realizing that this is actually how we're training mental health professionals. We're seeing it on the ground and with really vulnerable people. So not only is it impacting the people that it serves or that that this, these programs serve, but it's also impacting the professionals themselves in some really harmful ways. So I, I thought it would be great to have Andrew on to have a broader discussion around these topics. And and David, as a as a trainee psychologist, you're really experiencing this right now in your program. And so there's a lot of nuance and a lot of opportunity for good discussion. And thank you so much for joining us today, Andrew. 
Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. David, do you want to start us off with the intro to Solid Ground? Yeah, we'll do. Thanks, Leslie. Um, so Solid Ground is a peer support community for anyone concerned about the imposition of critical social justice, CSJ, aka woke and or COVID mandates in their workplace, university, children's school or community. We offer weekly online peer support groups in which members share ideas, thoughts and support for how to navigate the impact of these ideologies and to answer the question, where do we go from here? You can join one of our groups for only $5 per month. To find out how to join our community, please visit solidgroundsupport.com. And please note Solid Ground does not provide psychotherapy or legal advice and nothing we do should be construed as such. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks, David. And we try to keep an eye on the chat. So if you have any questions for Andrew or any comments about this as we go along or some experiences that you want to share, please do. We'll try to keep an eye and read those if we can. And 97 cents. I don't think I've seen you before. Welcome. And he uh, he or she says greetings all. So greetings. And Andrew, uh, so you you talked with me about some issues that you've been having at work. It's this this there were many issues in your work that you've been experiencing, some directed against you. And one of the things that was really striking to me was when you told me about a coworker who couldn't work with certain clients or patients because of the patients or clients, however you refer to them in your work, were misgendering this person. And so there was like protection for the worker that was put into place. And that seemed really, that was really striking to me. Have you seen a lot of things like that? Yeah, I mean, I, that was probably like the 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 most outrageous example, but definitely, you know, like part of what I'm going through with HR now is I made a book recommendation, and um, this is somebody in a leadership position in the nonprofit, and uh, they I was told that the the book title itself was inflammatory. Um, I was just, just to give context for the conversation, uh, the, we were talking about that specific incident of the person who, you know, was act, asking certain participants not to be around them because of they being misgendered. Um, so my manager, you know, we were covering that site because they were low on staff because a lot of people quit three people. And so, um, my manager said, it's alarming to me. I feel like a lot of young people um, uh, are lacking empathy. And, and so I followed up and said, yeah, I feel like they're lacking communication skills as well. And I said, oh, there's this book I'm reading that talks about this in depth and it's really, really great. And so I recommended The Coddling of the American Mind, right? And so it's within the context of that that I recommended this book. Of course, they report me to HR maybe because they're they're tied to that other spouse um so, but anyway so so here we are like like dealing with that that situation with that one staff member who just was was actively like like saying like i am not going to be around this this client like i don't want them around me and us covering for them and you know talking about just the sensitivity and lack of communication skills and i recommend this book and now it just, it, to me, it's alarming when people are so fragile and these are the people that we're entrusting to help others, um, you know, and it's, it, it's interesting because like my manager at work has been, had an ongoing thing with HR as well. And this is for like using words like accountability, right? Um, but if you go to our, our company's DEI website, they have accountability in bold letters on it. but it's like if we use it in the context of that, you know, of helping somebody, right? Um, but I think you know, the whole the whole community mental health, you know, particularly on the Pacific Northwest West Coast, is just it's about providing mater material goods, and then just that that it's a housing first model, and to 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 think that you you could hold somebody accountable is it's it's not a, not an orthodox view now, right? And um, I know like myself and my coworkers have all, we come out of the military, we've all experienced addiction. We wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have the people in our lives holding us accountable. 
Um, but yeah, it's I, I, I'm taking a day off because I'm dealing with the situation where I'm again, we're like providing we're providing material, you know, support to people. But I'm watching this guy spiral out for like a month and a half. I was dealing with multiple crises yesterday. No support. And then I'm on top of that, I'm dealing with like three, three HR investigations. It's not sustainable, you know, um, it, it's just, it isn't sustainable. So you said your manager has also been dealing with HR uh, over using the word accountability over, over trying. What do you mean by accountability in this context? So in this context, because we work for a veteran supportive housing. And so there's a lot of drug use, right? And, you know, we're all kind of, we, we came into this accepting that and knowing that and really supporting people, even if they don't want recovery, right? But the thing is with methamphetamine and drugs like that, the behaviors get really out of control. It becomes dangerous, like just flat out dangerous. There's a lot of violence. So we're, we've dealt with several, like a lot of violence. Um, and so it's so within the context of that, like saying, hey, like we get that people are using and people can handle their shit for lack of a better word, more power to them. But if they're like, if they're like running around the complex with a bat, like talking about bashing people's heads in, like we, we need to do something. And so, and you know, like me, I keep, I keep trying to tell them like, we, if we keep moving the line for people, then they're going to keep pushing that, you know? And um, so it's within the context of that, have those kinds of conversations. Um, it's, 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 yeah, it's, it's really bizarre. And, and, um, I mean, you can just look around Portland and you know, like this isn't working, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm, you know, like San Francisco as well. So. No, Deborah, you also live in a big city. What are your thoughts on all this? I don't think it's gotten as crazy here <laughs> as I, I don't know. I, I don't, I know there are some concerns about this whole, whether it's housing first and those sorts of models, but I don't think we're as quite as far along as the, the West coast is. I, I just was sitting here thinking about just the, the, the misplacement of boundaries uh, in these situations, right? Cause like the boundary is on, you can't misgender me and I'm the therapist but there's no boundary on the person who like behavior um, on keeping people like actually safe. I don't know. It's, 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 it's just like an inverted, completely inverted situation. Um, who's the adult? I mean, I, it's just, it's crazy. It really is crazy. I mean, I don't know how long it's going to take to crash or who's going to finally, I'm thinking about like who could do anything about this. Is it taxpayers? Like are taxpayers aware I don't know. I don't know where it gets so bad that whoever has the levers does something. I think that's that's what's happening in Portland right now. So they passed Measure 110, which decriminalized hard drugs under three three grams. So they decriminalized it. And now there's actually movements in a lot of cities. The legislature has to actually go back and rewrite the law to allow for cities to recriminalize it. But there's a huge movement and it's got the support of mayors and, and city council people um, in Portland and Salem, like the, the, you know, Eugene, the bigger cities. So the taxpayers are, you know, they're the ones like speaking up, it's, it's out of control. Um, but you know, I still think the issue is, is we're kind of like letting, I'm sorry, but woke, woke people coming out of, um, you know, social work school steer the ship, right? And and it's kind of like, you know, there's the whole gaslighting about gender, but there's all, this is gaslighting as well. Like, no, like, and then we're going to punish you for, for having this approach. We're, we're the ones who are right. Trust us, you know, but it's really, I mean, it's really harmful. I mean, it's, you just look around and, and Portland's got a 640,000 people. And, you know, a city like Philadelphia has like 1.5 million and Portland's is, I, I can guarantee it's as bad as a city twice or three times its size, if not worse. 
because you just walk around and people are like openly smoking fentanyl. What's the justification for that? What is the uh, justification for not holding people to some kind of community standard? I I don't I don't know. I, I really I don't understand it. I think initially, because I've been in the field for six years. Initially, like I supported it, right? Um, I Why think did you support it, it originally? Yeah, I think it was, I was kind of, I was in my, I was in a media bubble and I, I had my bubble and I just, I had like my, I wanted to believe it. And then I, I was inundated and surrounded myself with, with people and media that reinforced that. And so I just kind of went with it. I think a lot of it has to do with the, the reasoning behind it is because of the war on drugs. These people have been marginalized already. We need to back off. Um, and when you say these people, do you mean pe- people who are homeless or do you mean people who are drug addicted? What is the, what is the. I think I primarily homeless. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's drugs have different, different individual and societal effects. Um, there's a guy, Richard Nutt, he was a psycho, neuropsychopharmacologist, and he has like a brilliant graph of like, and it shows individual and societal impact of different drugs, mm-hmm. right? Alcohol being one of the worst, methamphetamine being right up there. Y- you know, like this information is out there, but again, like people are so, they have their, their bubbles and they have their lane and they're, they have their blinders on. Um, but I think, I, I mean, I was amazed when the people of Portland were like, we're done with this. You, you y'all need to recrim- like recriminalize it. Because I didn't think there there were that many sane people here, honestly. It's it's a pretty wild place. So, um, but yeah, I was initially supporting that, but um, y- you know, it, it's it just isn't working. You know, also, and I just want to say also housing first because I when I first heard the housing first thing a number of years ago, it was appealing because you could imagine saying, God, it's hard if you're not stable and you're living in a tent or something to try to get clean, you know, and whatever. So like, of course, of course, why not give these people this situation where they can, you know, but then they didn't tie that to any sort of, it seems in certain jurisdictions, any sort of requirements, you know, it's like, you can have the housing, but you just can keep hanging there doing what you're doing. Right. Right. And I, my whole argument is like, I, to me, this is like a radical social experiment i can't i I mean maybe y'all know of another instance where we've just on mass like said like accountability is terrible it's a bad idea we're not doing accountability anymore and and i feel like a lot of these woke woke people like they kind of like have this idealistic utopian vision of like indigenous and traditional societies and if, if they if we just could transport them over there they would see like, no, they, they may have radically different rules and norms, but they still hold people accountable. Like you, in order to be functional, you just have to. Um, mm. So it's bizarre to me. It's really bizarre. I'm just imagining you, Andrew, as someone who's, as you said earlier, has been in the army. You know, you've, you're someone who's had to really face like reality. You know, realities yeah. are, quite, you know, they're quite there and, and, and ever present when you're in the army you know, with a gun, with, with your life in your, you know, in your hands or in the hands of other people. It's just kind of like, you, you mentioned the people coming out of social work schools. Is that what you said? It feels like there's almost this complete disconnect from these individuals who come from these academic environments that they don't live in a real world. They have ideology that's not, not got any anchoring there. And that must be frustrating as hell for you. <laughs> right. And I think that's where a lot of the issues are arising at work. So you know, one of my bosses, he's, he was a naval aviator, right? And he was an officer and they don't like just let anybody fly, you know, aircraft in the Navy. So he had to demonstrate repeated sound judgment to a certain extent, but he's, he's also like experienced extreme addiction, right? And my other coworker was incarcerated. Uh, he was, he was in the military as well, incarcerated, uh, my other supervisor had experience with homelessness and drug addiction. And so we have that person, that experience. Um, and I think we're, we're really trying to just get, get them to listen, but yeah, it, it's a total disconnect. And, and our boss is somebody that 
I mean, didn't even go to social work school, but admits that, sh that they had a very sheltered life. And um, it's extremely frustrating. Um, yeah, it, it's frustrating on so many fronts. Um, and I, I, I did want to, well, I'm, I'll, I wanted to mention the, you, you, the, the um, intersectionality thing real quick, because I know that you, I think a lot of that, I mean, and I may be wrong, but like may depend on the end of the individual presenter and maybe like their lineage, I guess, like where they learned it from. Mm -hmm. um, because like I went through it here at my job and it was like openly disparaging white men, didn't even mention class, right? Um, but that's like kind of, that that person's been exposed to it probably through a, their, the training here and just pop culture, you know, like, but, um, but yeah, it's, and I, I, I don't know, um, yeah, I think I think a lot of a lot of this is like a lot of these companies, a lot of these nonprofits are already dysfunctional, right? Like the whole scenario that I described when I met with Leslie is manager one. Um, there's manager one who I worked for first, and then manager two, and they they're in two different positions now. But manager two was the manager of a program and hired their spouse to work directly underneath them and then promoted them to supervisor. And then this one went off to become a VP. And then this one went up, moved up and just kind of inherited that management role there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's not like they met on the job and kindled a romance. Like they had known each other since junior high. And so situations like that, nepotism, and I, I would, I would say corruption, um, like it's, mm -hmm. Stuff like that goes on in a lot of these mental health nonprofits. There's a, um, they opened up a big behavioral health recovery center in downtown Portland. So many issues. They had to shut it down for two weeks for staff training. There were staff using drugs. There was violence spilling out into neighboring businesses. A big time real estate lawyer is like subpoenaing the rep like that nonprofits, financial records, like going after them. I think there's, people are starting to see like, and they're putting pressure on the the state and local governments about how what they're doing with the money. But really, they need to look at the nonprofits. This is like a huge industry, um, and and so there's, it's yeah. I'm starting to get this picture that like when we're talking about homelessness in these big cities, like especially these big West Coast cities. I'm imagining Seattle, which I moved out of partly because of this problem because I was you know we were constantly having things stolen from our porch and, and tents were cropping up all over the place. I didn't feel safe with my kids going for a walk down the street. Um, and yeah, tent cities would just pop up and there'd be rivers of trash running down the hills from these tent cities. And, and people uh, like even in the small town that I just, I, uh, I was living in temporarily while I was waiting for home repairs. Um, I, I, we had a guy who would just wander around this huge guy who would wander around like erratically threatening people with a, with a makeshift pipe knife that he had, that he would carry this weird metal and wood thing that he'd made. And he would lunge at people. It was just this terrifying thing. So you'd have these, these, the homelessness is going nuts. And at the same time, you're talking about this, seeing these people as victims of, society and so we don't want to hold them accountable we want to give them comforts and housing and we don't want to expect them to get off drugs or to stop their threatening behaviors so that's the accountability that you're talking about we're not holding them accountable um and these nonprofits, when we're pumping a bunch of funding into the homelessness crisis it's going to these nonprofits that are then being staffed up with with recent social justice graduates who have this whole societal institutional framework in mind and don't want to hold again, coming back to the individual, don't want to see this as any kind of an individual issue. Uh, is that picture kind of accurate? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. That I think you, you said it all very well. And like, you know, you, you mentioning that, yeah, we, they look at them as victims and because of their victims and we have to 
create special um, special rules for them, right? But meanwhile, you have people in the community, you have families, right, that are doing their best as well, and and they're the ones that end up having to move. Um, we we had to call crisis line last night for one of the gentlemen that was ongoing um, escalation of behavior. And, you know, she was like, there's nothing we can do. Like, she's like, I get it. Like, this is happening all over Portland. Like people that are, you know, like good neighbors end up having a move, you know, because their, their hands are tied. Um, And it's almost like these, these, uh, these victims of the criminal justice system and of society that we see out on our streets now have more rights than all of us. And, and it's, I never thought I would say something like that, right? Like, but but here I am, and the the proof is in the pudding. And I'm all for helping people get housing, but I don't think we're doing them or anybody else any favors by not treating them like adults, like humans, right? Um, it's 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 tearing tearing cities apart, you know. And if the rest of the country wants an idea of what like a lot of these um, I don't even want to say liberal because they're not liberal. They're like, they're just uh, bizarre, <laughs> far left policies. If you want to see what, what they do, like look at Portland, right? We, we rank like last in youth mental health, last in access to mental health, like, like last in addiction. And then you just, it's not safe. Like there's, yeah, it's just not safe. This is, this is what it, what it will bring you. I also want to say in New York, I don't know about the community mental health centers, but there are definitely people here that talk about the homelessness industrial complex, mostly related to the housing and shelter thing. Like there's, there, there are people that are thinking there's a lot of grift going on in that and some incentive to keep the system in place. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some of these discussions around actually holding people accountable, like, cause I, it's a, supposed to be a secure building and we have like older vulnerable veterans there. There's, you know, like a 69 year old lady who has a walker and she just has to lock herself in her apartment. Mm. So when we have these conversations about like, Hey, like we need to like take action and evict people or, or give them 30 days and maybe work on plans to get them in treatment, give them some incentive. Um, and one of the VA caseworkers was like, well, if they leave, then they lose the, you know, they're losing funding for that. Mm-hmm. Oh know? my gosh. It, so it's like, it's not even like a, it, it's not really, it's like an open secret and it's, it's sometimes talked about. It's just, it's matter of fact, you know? Yeah, it's, it's, it is. I think that's when an organization has really lost its way when they forget about their mission and their objective becomes to sustain the organization and they forget about the people they originally intended to help. And I also come from a community mental health center and um, it wasn't at that point because it's not in Portland, it's right outside Washington, DC, but um, there, you know, the population that we were dealing with was one of the most vulnerable populations, people with severe chronic mental illness and addictions. And the people really, they don't have any other place to go. So to me, I think it's extraordinarily important that community mental health centers are able to provide competent care because these people, they don't have any choices in terms of where they can go for the most part. A lot of them are uninsured or they only have Medicaid, most um, clinicians in private practices won't accept their insurance and don't wanna take cases that are so severe because of the liability. Um, And to see organizations like that, because it happened in my organization, to see organizations like that go woke, um, it's really, really disheartening because yes, it hurts the staff and it certainly hurt me, but I think, about the patients who don't have, they don't really have an alternative. Right, and that's another part of all this is just the the lack of access to resources, to competent care, right? And I I mean, like from from medication management, like psychiatrists, 
psychiatric nurse practitioners to, you know, like just a day program or whatever, whatever the case may be. Um, but then, you know, they're, they're losing like really wonderful staff because mm -hmm. we're, it's, it's, it's difficult work already. And then again, when I'm dealing with three HR investigations, you know, and, and these HR investigations are over you raising questions. Yes. Well, so one of them, I mean, they might actually be tied to that, right? They might actually be tied to me, like speaking up about things, but for sure, one of them, I was, my boss um, made allegations of hate speech and harassment because we had a discussion about, they initiated it, right? And they were talking about, and they're trans, right? And they were talking about going to a pride parade to show support. And um, they had said that seven states made it illegal to be trans. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's not accurate. Seven states made it illegal for physicians to prescribe hormone blockers, perform sex reassignment surgeries. Um, and then because of that, I was accused of hate, hate speech. So because of a conversation that you had, that's, that's sort of uh, adjacent okay. to your work. It's just a, I think you described this to me. It was, you, you were just having a break together and having this conversation. Yeah. And so that's enough reason to tie and gum up the works with right. a quibble over whether it's hate speech to have a disagreement over the letter of the, the law. Yeah, and yeah. so you're, you're getting sidetracked here from this important work that you're doing. And it seems like when, when we talk about care for this population, you know, homeless, drug addicted, you're talking about care, you're talking about all the different levels of mental health care. It seems like the, if they are victims, they're victims of societal uh, lack of so social boundaries, lack of social structure in the first place. And so I, it seems like a, a process to build that structure back into their lives with accountability, as you're saying, is the, the remedy, not not a bunch of care. I mean, maybe I'm right. getting in the weeds here, but, and maybe it's, I don't know. I certainly they do need care. They do need people to understand and help them walk back towards something that looks like a, like a structured life. But I don't know. It sounds like a coddling. And so the irony of being reprimanded for recommending the book, the coddling of the American mind. It's just... <laughs> yeah. And that, that was... I'm getting tongue tied here, but yeah. <laughs> and that was, that was the third investigation, which was brought by the spouse of the manager that made the other one. Oh. And yeah, I mean, I, so many of the people that I've worked with over the years are out on the streets because they didn't, they had a house growing up, but they may not have had a home. They didn't have that structure. They, it was chaos, right? And and so so many of them, yeah, they a big part of it is just structure and like supporting them and 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 connecting them to resources so they can build a little more structure. And I mean care is important, but I, I think it's like a it, it's it's like a it's like a on the level of like pathology. Like it's like a, a expression of like unexpressed caretaking instinct that's just so pathological that again like and this this you can see this on a microcosm with with an individual who's struggling with addictions family or friends right there's there's always somebody that's like gonna pay for their apartment or you know what i mean like and other yeah. people are like no like like they need they need to hit rock bottom and i i mean at least from my own experience and so many people that i work with that's what we needed. I needed to have all my relationships destroyed. I needed to be living out of my car for me to go, oh shit, like I really have to do something, you know? Well, it comes back yeah. to the definition of enabling, which is what protecting someone from the consequences of their own actions. Yeah. And so that's what we, we have as a system that's enabling these people to continue to hurt themselves. It's like they've just been given up on. There's no, we, we don't have any hope that this person can regain some kind of competence in their own life. So we're just going to build walls around them while they spin out of control. That's, that's it. And that's what I told my boss yesterday. I was like, I'm going to be taking the day off tomorrow. Like I can't sit here and watch like 
like basically, like you said, building walls around people and pr providing for them materially, but then just allowing them to spin out and, and hurt themselves and hurt others because so many of these like housing first apartment complexes or motels, like they're dangerous places, you know, like um, the, the one, the, the motel complex that they started, man, this, my company started managing, there's like sexual assaults and like just wild stuff that happened there. And, and, you know, the people, the other people in those places deserve better and the communities around them deserve better, you know? You know, I'm thinking about the schools, like the either like the Michaela school in the UK or the charter schools where, you know, having children come in who have been in situations where there wasn't, you know, maybe there's one parent or hasn't been that stable and actually having pretty strict structures. And this might not be suitable for, for everybody, but like even at Michaela school, I remember there was a story of like the kids have to be there on time. And this kid was like, well, I don't even have anybody to get me up and I don't even have a clock. And they were like, I don't care. There's no excuse. We'll help you figure out how to get a clock. So what are you going to do? Okay. You need to get it, like do some work and then you get some money and then you buy the clock. And it's, some of it sounds really harsh to me. Like I'd have a hard time being like that, but like she has really good um, performance of these kids. And I mean, some people think she's like fascist or whatever, but, but even at some of the charter schools where they have the kids wear uniforms and you know, there's certain things that, that like, there's no excuses, your stuff has to be in on time and all of that, like it really does serve them. And I don't know, it's interesting, like that somehow that people critique it, but it, it is showing some success. And I wish they'd translate this over to mental health. Yeah, but being on time is white supremacy. <laughs> well, she's probably getting that flack, even though what is it, Kat, what was her name, Catherine Burble saying, I think she's from yeah. her family was from the Caribbean. I mean, she's like, Sorry, I'm black. Whatever, right? <laughs> it's like it's, it's, uh, even, even if the analysis or the assessment of, of of someone's plight and their situation is that yes, they've been shat on by society. Even if that's the case, even if you can say that that this person really is at rock bottom, you have to ask yourself what is helpful for this person. What is helpful for them to move forward? Is it to continue pushing all of the agency towards structures around them, or is it about fostering something of an internal locus of control? Um, and it sounds to me, Andrew, like I can't imagine what like your team meetings must be about in a minute. Like what? Like do, do, do you? Surely you're all just sitting there going, "What the hell can I say? What can I do to give any agency to this person?" Because I'm locating the problem in them or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, morale's getting pretty low there, and and I think <laughs> um, I, my bosses, we're all still trying to push back a little bit, but but we're 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 all, we're starting to give up at this point because it's just it's taking a toll on us personally you know so it's like what are we going to do you know, i'm wishing my fantasy is that some funder somebody sees this video and gets all of you guys especially all of you that had the military training have gone through recovery from addiction and says okay we're just going to set up a center over here and we're <laughs> going to let you guys do it the right way so hello if there's any investors <laughs> <laughs> right yeah, and there there was um so Multnomah County, the county that Portland's in, built like this big jail complex just not too many years ago, didn't use it. And so this this faith-based um recovery and homeless services center opened up. And they they were running off of private donations for so long, then they needed funding. And so they asked Multnomah County, who had like 63 million that they weren't using for funding. Mm -hmm and they wouldn't fund them and initially, and there was a lot of back and forth, but a lot of people believe it's because of their approach and it's, you know, it's faith-based, but it was, a, it was a program where they actually held people accountable and like, like tried to develop them, you know, and, and help them develop the skills necessary to, to be functional, you know? And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've seen this a lot where, where I live now too. I live in a small town northeast of Seattle, about a 45 minute drive to Seattle. So it's not right there. And we have, um, I lived across the street from a, an empty school building. And in the afternoons, there would be groups of people that would congregate there and do drugs. And you could see them from our porch, guys without shirts on, there were constant thefts off of porches. Um, 
And these people were, were alarming to look at, you know, they sometimes be shouting at people. Sometimes they'd be getting into fights with each other. And I, uh, I called the police a couple of times. One time my car was, a, there was an attempted break-in and, you know, another time, just a, just a clearly intoxicated guy walking down the street without a shirt on and, and, um, you know, just, just very threatening in a neighborhood, in a neighborhood with cute little homes and just a working class area with kids. And, and so I'd called the cops a couple of times when I'd see these things happen. And what I was told is the governor decriminalized, we decriminalized drug use. And now they used to have a sort of a no intoxication zone in the middle of the city. I don't remember what they called it. They had these words for it, but this, like they, they weren't allowed to do drugs openly or be openly intoxicated. They removed those, those laws, those, those restrictions. And now there's nothing that they can do except come and, and tell them to move along. So that's all they can do is sort of rouse them from one place to another. And um, it's, it's just such an increasing problem. Do you see anything like that in the UK, David, or is this kind of a US centric issue? Um. I mean, we have a, we have a national health service, so um, things are a little bit different with that. With public sector, um, I guess we've got a kind of a different welfare system. Um, I do think that I, I do wonder sometimes where the NHS uh, is going when it comes to sort of taking on work ideas that that seem to be obsessed with keeping people um, in a sort of maternalized form you know like kind of not letting them sort of find agency in their own lives and 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 making 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 out that the narrative we should understand everybody's plight is about kind of understanding how society's been 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 shitting on them um i kind of wonder i wonder like if maybe our because we don't have the same the same issues in terms of like sort of welfare safety nets whether the uk is quite different in some ways um i certainly have you know heard about portland and what's been going on in america and I, I i do it does make me kind of think like huh i can't imagine that happening here in the uk so um you know the biggest things we get are kind of riots against uh police and we get we get sort of um big stories like Sarah Everard and things like that, that mean, make, mean that we get a big, uh, there's a big swell of mistrust for public services, particularly the police, in fact. Um, and we get riots that cause lots of mayhem, particularly in inner city areas like London. But homelessness, homelessness continues to be a problem, I think, but I don't know if we talk about it that much. It doesn't seem to be that it's seen as much as it is for people living in certain areas of the US. You guys can't avoid it and my brother actually visited san francisco recently and he he said david you wouldn't believe it like it's 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 there in front of you and i didn't feel safe at all and he says walking through a street in in the uk in this inner city area of the uk it feels like quite a, a thing we don't have to think too much about but he said i really didn't feel safe at all there and i think that probably means that on some level i can't quite relate to what what, what that must be like for you guys in those some of those areas in the US. You know, I'm also thinking, was it in Portugal? Because like Portugal, I think they decriminalize drugs, but they have something that you can't be in public intoxic, you know, higher intoxicate. Like they will, you, you need to keep it to at home or something like that. So it's, I, I don't know if that's a great policy, but it's like they, it's definitely that distinction of you're not allowed to be messing in the public space. Mm-hmm. Well, and I remember when we had the big decrim defund the police thing going on and uh, Antioch University sent out a bunch of stuff about that. They were super big on defund the police and just put in more social workers. So what is this? Is this what that looks like? Just put in more, more social workers. And Jennifer, did you see it going that direction when you were in community <laughs> mental health? <laughs> no, we hadn't. Uh, we certainly weren't talking about that, but... <laughs> My response to that as a licensed clinical social worker is don't call me. <laughs> I am not going into domestic violence situations or going to have just a pleasant little talk with someone who is, you know, running down the street naked, swinging an axe. That is not the time for a social worker. 
<laughs> so <laughs> not gonna happen. That's a fantasy. Wow. Ash Brown in the chat says, is there any way of quietly circumventing these rules that are binding you in order to get a positive result for your clients? Uh, I mean, the other challenge is just working within the system, you know, and, and kind of like what you were just saying, like there was the whole defund the police thing here. Right. So, you know, like this, this gentleman, was running around with a bat. We called the police. Well, we called crisis. Crisis said, call the police. The police come. And they're like, we, we're not doing anything, right? Like, you know, and that, that could have been a, uh, an opportunity for him to actually be taken to, to uh, you know, a voluntary or involuntary hold, right? Which is what, what he actually needs. So yeah. the police are handcuffed, right? So they, they can't step in in those situations where somebody's riding down the street naked, swinging an ax. They can't. Um, they can't. That's no. not an offense anymore to be. Uh, I mean, well, not in not in Portland. I mean, wow. it's, it's really. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> no, it's it's really wild. So uh, <laughs> only only if he misgendered somebody. I'm gonna <laughs> just. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I, yeah. I just want to say something really quick because because this keeps coming up, and I'm not picking on you at all, Andrew. But like yesterday, I was talking with Benjamin, and he was talking about people like some guy was swinging a skateboard at a cop or something. And he just, he said, these two gentlemen were swinging a skateboard at a cop. And, and when you just said gentlemen again, I'm just like, we use this word. And does it mean what it used to mean? Because I just picture like some dapper gentleman with a skateboard. <laughs> I mean, sorry, that's a total no, non sequitur, but. That's a good point. Cause I mean, I think I'm, I'm definitely self-censoring. Right. And I'm, Right. There's other words that I would like to use. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah. So and and you know the the VA and and like I said, there's just not enough treatment options. So the stuff, the things that he needs, they're not available, right? Or or people don't want to do it. Um, the the police, like my my boss was telling me at the motel housing that they have, this this guy sexually assaulted somebody else, but. He was so gro he was like so dirty and smelled so strongly. The police literally were like, "We're not messing with that right now. We're just not are, even going to mess with it." Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh! He smells too bad. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's too dirty to arrest. Right. He smells. Yeah, he smells too bad. Call a social worker. Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> oh no. But, but but like but the the police here have been so demoralized, right? Like people here, they're they're you know verbally assaulted they had the whole deep on the police thing and portland's very radical so they're not very kind to police here and the the policies and procedures that they put in place have, they're they're demoralized so um yeah and i i have to say is so because of the world that i've lived in for the last six years it's really refreshing to hear somebody say to hear a social worker say like don't call me Right. Like that's 100 percent not my deal, because here the attitude is different. Like they really think that, like. You can just go and reason with somebody who's meth out, you know, like, no, that just doesn't work. No, no. Well, and the thing is, you know, I, I worked in the state psychiatric facility for seven and a half years. And even in a contained facility, there are times when you can't reason with a person who's psychotic. And that's when everyone comes running and, um, you know, physically um, forces them into a shot, you know, and right. I am antipsychotic when it's necessary. You know, a whole team has to do a takedown, basically, when you can't reason with someone. So, no, we cannot go out and just have a little hygiene lesson or you know, something like that with people. That is just so, that is such a childish fantasy. Well, so there's this this social trajectory where we used to have asylums, we used to have involuntary commitment, and there was this move to walk that back because that was seen as really abhorrent and overly oppressive and people were being treated very, uh, very poorly in these places. And so now we have sort of this inversion of that, this complete reversal of that where 
there's nothing you you almost like you said you can't in portland you can run down the street naked threatening people and you're not even eligible for some kind of involuntary commitment what's the answer is there something else that that we should be doing if, if the excesses of one side and then the excesses of the other it's like a pendulum swing what's the what is the solution what do you think we should be doing i i mean this is the conversation i was having with my boss yesterday i i, I talked about all this all of this specifically like our move away from psychiatric institutions mm -hmm. to community mental health but but like as you just said jennifer like like there are times where you like literally need to tackle somebody and hit them with Thorazine or something, you know, like the thing is, is so because we don't have these structures or systems in place, nobody knows what to do. So we're just kind of like, the police can't do anything. We can't, I, I mean, I really think that we we need more psychiatric beds, right? We, we still oh, need, yeah. community, you know, um, we need like step down facilities, right? So yeah more integrative and then we also just need more like focus on building that autonomy and the structure and and people so like really have programs like that like more in-depth like long-term supportive programs for people because so like my experience has been like somebody will come from the state hospital go to a transitional housing program for two years they'll have support right then they put them in an apartment complex and then with zero support. And then the apartment complex is filled with meth. They spiral out of control. They set the whole place on fire or murder somebody that's happened to people I've worked with. And so it just needs to be more comprehensive. And it's like, this is, it's such a big problem. They really need to just start devoting resources and time and, and really think about things and, I think that's what's so scary is like this ideology, right? To where people can't, people are disconnected and they don't even want to look at empirical reality. So they're just, they're really, so you can't even talk to them and, and go like, hey, like this, but um, hopefully like the, the taxpayers and the people, of, I don't know, like really like, that's why I always encourage people like in Portland, like if there's an issue, like, hammer the the city government or write you know like do everything you can to speak up because this is this is not acceptable you know and where well, do you know line? sorry jennifer go ahead oh i was just going to say one of the things that we've done in fairfax county instead of sending unarmed social workers out into dangerous situations what they've done is there's a certain segment of the fairfax county police force that is specifically trained on dealing with people that are facing a mental health crisis so I think that's an excellent idea because they have the ability to, you know, bring somebody in if needed, but they also know how to recognize, oh, maybe this person's exhibiting symptoms of um, a mental health crisis and um, they know how to handle that a bit more sensitively. Well, Jennifer, maybe you could learn to sort of handle a taser or something like that, you know? <laughs> Is that a taser that looks like a gun? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. a big taser. <laughs> taser just looks like a TV remote, doesn't it? Really? Yeah, it does. yeah, yeah. They're just little Star things. Trek, yeah. like yeah. I yeah. like David's David's taser is like. Oh. It's a very that's a very manly taser you have there. Yeah, what's the line though between uh, mental health crisis and criminal behavior? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, is it just a criminal behavior by someone whose mental health is questionable is automatically a mental health crisis? But then uh, wouldn't most criminal behavior, uh, you know, at some level be either social or mental? Absolutely. Yeah. And so like a perfect example is this person, this gentleman in our building um, was having ongoing issues and escalating and they took a cinder block, this is a secure building, and they took a cinder block and threw it through the glass door, right? And and so several of my fellow coworkers were like, okay, well that's that's you know against the law, A, right? And it's it's it was a, an expensive door. Um, 
our boss immediately said, well, but, but their mental health. And, and so these are the kinds of things that are like, just excuse, right? People are shielded from uh, natural consequences, right? Like if I did that, or you did that, or anybody else did that, you know, like there's a good outside of Portland, but if we did that somewhere else, like there's a good chance we would be held accountable. But within the, the world of community mental health, no, because they have a mental health issue. And again, he, he really, it was meth, you know, it was methamphetamine. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Like, I think anybody, like if somebody murders somebody, whether they're, they have a diagnosed mental illness or it's like, to me, that that's a mental health, issue. you know, like something's wrong. Right. So well, Robert Forbes says, I think the line is action versus behavior, but I don't understand what the difference is there. I don't, I guess I don't understand. Um, and one of the things that <clears throat> I've talked about this a bunch, but one of the things that was so concerning about my, to me, about my clinical mental health training was that we were told over and over, uh, you know, you were working with our um assigned mock clients throughout the course of this program were assigned to other counseling students in order to work through different, um, you know, different training processes. And we're told over and over, if you can't diagnose this person, talk to your professor, we'll get you a diagnosis. We'll figure out the diagnosis. So there's a, and you're talking about, you know, a bunch of graduate students there that presumably are pretty high functioning people. And they all have a diagnosis. There's room for all of you in the in the DSM. So everybody, it's very inclusive. It's very <laughs> inclusive. Yeah, that's right. So by that logic, we all are diagnosably mentally ill in one way or another. And so at at this point, does the whole thing fall apart? And there's just no accountability anywhere because we all have something we can point to. And say it's my adjustment disorder, it's my anxiety, it's my, you know, whatever it might be. But I mean, the whole thing, see, it seems like it's become this broad stroke, this big brush that you can paint everything with. Well, ultimately, you know, I mean, if somebody <clears throat> who is, uh, you know, does something in public that's dangerous to themselves or others, here in Virginia, they still stand a very good chance of being arrested. And the police officers then may determine that they need mental health attention. And we do have people in jails that can um, evaluate the person for mental health needs, but then it eventually ends up, um, you know, being the court's business as to um, what the situation is, you know, that's where the whole NGRI comes in, people pleading not guilty by reason of insanity. But also we had clients at the mental health center who had been arrested for very disruptive um, behavior in the community. And because they were evaluated in jail upon their release, when they were on probation, it was determined that as part of their probation, they had to come to outpatient mental health treatment. So in that case, and the chart, the person still, you know, these people still had legal charges, but treatment was part of the um, response to their dangerous behavior in the community. Mm -hmm. Any kind of social rehabilitation though, seems like it would require an accountability process. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm, well, I'm, it's probably good it hasn't happened as I hear all this in Portland and the, the removal of the police, like I almost could imagine like vig vigilantism almost coming in or something like that. Like, it's like interesting that like, think it seems like that hasn't happened yet, but I feel nervous about it. Mm -hmm. have, has there been, have people talked about that or are people too, probably in Portland, people are too liberal to consider doing something like that, or they wouldn't own firearms or something. So yeah, it's it's so I'm on a couple of the Portland subreddits and people are starting to talk about that. Really? Um, hmm. Yeah, but it's it's interesting because and I think like so one one person commented and I thought it was really moderate, but it was shut down immediately. But I think the person was more or less expressing like just exasperation at like living in a city that's totally unsafe and having 
people build a shed like literally like right next to their backyard where their kids play and doing drugs and so he was like oh it's getting to that point you know and um yeah and to talk to just to to mention real quick before i forget because i did want to mention california actually expanded their involuntary commitment um they, they loosened the, the the requirements because they at least they acknowledge that there's a huge like issue so they've expanded it to um like severe substance use so they can somebody can be uh involuntary uh get put on an involuntary hold for that now which is what what i mean at least on the west coast so many of us need it because a, a big part of the issue is just rampant cheap and mind-altering methamphetamine so well i know we have oh. to wrap up um i wanted to read this in the in the chat edward duhame says turning victim status into identity prevents accountability which i think is a is very well said any last thoughts before we wrap cheery conversation today <laughs> welcome to my world uh, <laughs> thank you so much andrew and Thank and you. thanks for shedding light on this. It's really, I mean, I, I feel like the homeless issue is, I, I have not talked about it very much because I feel uninformed. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know where to start with it, but this is a great place to start. And um, thank you for your insights. Cool. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, Andrew. Thank thanks you. to everyone in the chat as well. We'll see you guys next week. And let's see, going to cancel recording. Okay. <laughs>